wow, I still have my AirPods in. I'm dumb. Sup, folks. My name is Georgie Grimm, clearly. And, <laughs> um, and today, we are going to be talking about something interesting. Something local for me, actually, too. Like, local to my home. Not, like, Ellensburg, but, like, Seattle, where I'm originally from. The OG home of Georgie. Do you see what I just did there? You do, and you hate me because of the way that I just introed it. Or, you know, whatever. <laughs> Yayi Beach. I hate myself. Like, wow. Me editing this is gonna be like, why am I such an idiot? <laughs> and I'm gonna be sitting there and be like, yeah, you're a fucking dumbass. Sorry. Wow. Out of body experience for Georgie right there. So, okay. Let me front load this first. When did I do this? Last week? Yeah, it definitely was last week. Last week felt like a year ago. Man. Anyway, so last week I went to go see a play that was part of the Short Works Festival at my school that my school does every single year, which is student directed, produced, acted, run, all that jazz. It's pretty much all student run. And basically there's like six plays that are short works. Each play is about 15 to 20 minutes long, I should say. But there was this one play that really struck me and it inspired me to do a video about it. And it was called Aurora and it was written by a professor in my department and he's brilliant he's a playwright and he wrote this amazing piece that was a story about a couple that are on the Aurora bridge but we see both of them lights down holding hands together and then lights come up only one of them is on stage and that's Kai and then we see the other come on stage and he's in tattered clothing and I at first thought he was homeless but then further into the scene, I soon realized that this other character whose name is Gabe is now dead and we're seeing the apparition of Gabe and Kai, his boyfriend in the play is alive and he's come to the Aurora Bridge to jump and kill himself. And it was a very powerful piece. There was a certain aspect to it where I was watching it and it, it just, it felt so familiar to me, if you will, which sounds really strange. And I don't know why. It's not like I've had, you know, the same experience, fortunately, but it felt familiar to me because it's in my home state. That's in my hometown. Like, it's in Seattle, man. The Aurora Bridge is a bridge that is in Seattle. Seattle, Washington, and it goes right over Lake Union. And, and Lake Union Union is home to me. Like my family grew up boating and we would go through Lake Union to the locks. We'd go through the locks to go to the ocean to go up to the San Juan Islands. And like we would go under that bridge. And that to me as a whole is just like so it sits with me in a weird kind of headspace. Because first off, I did not know the history of the Aurora Bridge for it to be known as a suicide jumping bridge. It sounds really fun. Up. I had not known the Aurora Bridge to be known for suicide. I never even knew that. I had no idea that specifically the Aurora Bridge was where people would come from out of the state to kill themselves on that bridge. And it fucks with you. I both empathize and sympathize with people who have depression and people who have been suicidal because I know what that's like to be depressed. It fucking sucks. And I know what it feels like to not know if your existence is worth its time on this earth because I've dealt with both those things and it's not fun. And aside from that, the idea is that this hits home for me for many specific reasons. I will insert some footage of what the Aurora Bridge in Seattle looks like, some photos that I may or may not have taken with my own camera. Ooh, bitch. Ooh, bitch. Who you fighting? Who you fighting? Ooh, bitch. Uh -huh. Um, I'm embarrassed by myself right now. That's fine. Where the fuck was I in my thought process? What else was there? What else? What else? What else was there? Back to the video, am I right? Cast that shadow on me, mommy. That was weird. So, basically what happened with the girl on the bridge is what this article is titled. And I'm going to read this article to you guys because apparently I'm choosing to do that because it's actually a really fascinating article and it'll give you the entire basis of like what 
History of the Aurora Bridge. Basically, what the Aurora Bridge is, is it is a bridge in Seattle, Washington that connects Fremont and Queen Anne. And it is a freeway bridge. And so, like I said earlier in the video, it goes over Lake Union. And then, okay, I'm gonna give you the history of this bitch. Here comes teacher Georgie and her fucking history lessons. Hell yeah. About to get learn real good baby basically the bridge was built in 1929 the entire bridge over 80 years for over what what i'ma just read the article to you how does that sound Good. Okay, stop. The Aurora Bridge was the Northwest's most notorious suicide site for over 80 years. After one man's plan to finally erect a fence to deter fatalities was stalled, a race unfolded to save one last jumper. This is an article titled The Girl on the Bridge, and this is from the Seattle Met. So the last thing Kay said on the phone a little before midnight was unsettling enough. Ryan, I love you. I gotta go. It was nice to know you but now she wouldn't answer her cell. She wasn't in her Queen Anne apartment. She wasn't in the park they'd strolled through hand in hand days earlier. He didn't know where she was. He just knew he had to find her. Finally, around 1.30 a.m. Sunday, January 16, 2011, after pounding on his girlfriend's door, after multiple calls went straight to voicemail, Brian Wilson, a 29-year-old sustainable business consultant, dialed 911. A Seattle police cruiser met him on the corner of Queen Anne Avenue and Roy minutes later. Do you have any reasons to believe she might hurt herself or others? Asked Officer Kurt Alstrom. Yes, Brian said. She's severely depressed. Soon, every police radio in Seattle crackled with the name. Kaylin Rose Campbell, 25 years old, green eye, red or auburn hair, five feet, eight inches tall. What the radio message couldn't convey was that few people who knew Kay had ever met anyone more intelligent or more beautiful, that she dabbled in six languages and had traveled halfway around the globe by the time she was 20, that she could hear any tune once and play it back on a keyboard that she laughed so loud you could feel it in your spine nothing in that call to all police unions could explain how Kaylin Campbell had been struggling for the past few months how she had told those closest to her that she hated herself and that she convinced she was a bad person and that she felt trapped any idea where she might be? Officer Alstron asked. Brian recalled the background noise he'd heard during their last phone conversation. Wind, traffic. He thought of their conversations during the past week. Where do you think she is? The officer pressed. I think she's at the bridge, Brian said. The Aurora Bridge. He knew the words were loaded and that they sounded preposterous. Someone's distressed and I automatically assume she's going to jump off the Aurora Bridge. I hate words. But the cliche exists for a reason. The bridge, site of more than 230 suicides, is second in the U.S. only to San Francisco's Golden Gate in number of jumpers. So dire had the suicide problem become, especially for the vocal minority who lived and worked below the bridge, that the Washington State Department of Transportation was nearly finished constructing a $5 million suicide fence. The project had been solved first by the historic preservationists who want to keep the nearly 80 year old bridge looking exactly as it did when it was erected in 1932 and later by engineering setbacks and unforeseen noise complaints. If Kaylin Campbell was on the span connecting Queen Anne to Fremont, staring into the darkness 15 stories down at either the ship canal or its banks, she had joined hundreds of others who had come to the bridge for the same reason since before it was even completed. Wednesday, January 20th, 1932, H.N. McKean, a recently divorced shoe salesman from West Seattle, traveled to the unfinished George Washington Memorial Bridge drank a jigger of bromade, bromade, bromide, what? <laughs> Hello? <laughs> what is bromide? What is bromide? What be the bromide? I must look it up so I don't look like an idiot. Let's see, what is bromide? Bromide is a compound of bromine with another element or group, especially a salt containing the anion Br negative or an organic compound with bromine bonded to the alkyl radical. I am not a chemist, if you can tell, because I don't know how to pronounce any of those words. And please feel free to correct me in the comments down below because honey, I know. So basically what I think think bromide is essentially poison. Okay, cool, great. Let's read this sentence over. 
Wednesday, January 20th, 1932, H.N. McKean, a recently divorced shoe salesman from West Seattle, traveled to the unfinished George Washington Memorial Bridge, drank a jigger of bromide, and jumped. He died instantly on the ground, 65 feet below. The crowd poured down 2nd Avenue on the morning of February 22nd, 1932. Hey, that day is coming up. Oh my god. And waved small American flags. A river of red, white, and blue gushing towards the new steel structure on the north end of town. At exactly 10 a.m., church bells chimed throughout Seattle, commemorating the moment 200 years earlier when George Washington was born. By 2 p.m., this is just so weird. By 2 p.m., the throng of fedoras and ringleted hairdos, nearly 20,000 people, reached the bridge, the dedication of which was to be the national highlight of the bicentennial celebration. The 2,945 foot long, 70 foot wide, cantilever span, officially named the George Washington Memorial Bridge, soared over Lake Union and was the last link in the Pacific Highway, which ran from the Canadian border to the Mexican border. Which is pretty fucking cool, by the way. Like, that's actually really fucking cool. Are you kidding? Like, that's so cool. What? That is so cool. Didn't even know that. Dignitaries from Canada and Mexico, the mayor of Seattle, and Washington's governor gave speeches. Twelve trumpets sounded 3,000 miles away in the White House. President Herbert Hoover, two years into presiding over the largest financial crisis in U.S. history, pressed a telegraph key at exactly four minutes before 3 p.m. The message surged across the continent in seconds, triggering a siren at the bridge, a 21-gun salute, and streams of water from fireboats. An enormous American flag unfurled 500 feet above the crowd. The excitement of the day may have overshadowed the shoe salesman's suicide a month earlier, but Seattleites were soon reminded of the bridge's deadly pull. Within three weeks, police were ordered to stand guard at the bridge to thwart a Fremont woman who had threatened to jump off. A month after that, the span saw its second suicide. A man leapt off the bridge onto the train tracks on 34th Street. In September 1934, responding to three or four suicides in that year alone, the Seattle Daily Times editorial page pleaded with the city council asking that a very high fence with incurved top be built to surmount the guardrails for the full length of the Aurora Bridge. The body count mounted on February 3rd, 1938, Six years after the bridge dedication, 26-year-old Alex Cohen, owner of the Sausage Casing Company, became the 20th person to jump to his death. The next day, the Times again brought up the fence. This time on the front page, anti-suicide fence urged on the Aurora Bridge. A poll revealed that a majority of Seattleites supported the creation of the suicide barrier. The decades ticked by. The death toll reached 105 by 1973. By the 1980s, officials had stopped keeping track. This may be because the official count was lost as the duty of recording suicides transferred from agency to agency. But a new attitude about reporting suicides had emerged. Releasing such numbers of the details of the deaths, the theory went, only encourages more suicides. The names of the deceased disappeared and the new stories. Then the stories themselves vanished. When Ryan Thurston looked out of his office window in September 2005 and spotted a man laying face down in the parking lot, he wasn't sure what he was seeing. A design engineer for Impinjay, which specializes in radio frequency identification technology. Thurston and his co-workers had moved to an office building below the Fremont side of the Aurora Bridge two months earlier. Employees at Adobe in the same office park stood at their windows too, staring in horror as a pool of blood expanded around the man's head. Was he a victim of a hit and run? Then Thurston craned his gaze upward. Traffic on the bridge had stopped. A handful of people peered over the railing and down at the dead man. A few weeks later, Thurston saw another jumper, then another. So, side note for the folks at home here, let's make this personal. So, basically, because I live in Seattle, and because I like to adventure around to pretty much every single corner of Seattle I can possibly access on foot, I ventured all the way out to Fremont this summer and I became relatively familiar with that part of Seattle. I love Fremont. Fremont is a great area. And that parking lot that they're talking about in this article is the parking lot in which I will insert some photos that I took of that parking lot or structure, whatever they're talking about, but I know exactly where they are and exactly what they're talking about. I was literally there and I didn't know about this and that's just so fucking mind blowing to me and that makes me feel fucking sick. I hate it okay next okay let's keep going with the article here just 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 thought i let y'all know what that what what my feelings about that is all right 
Let's go. People crawled over the bridge's three foot high guardrail and fell from the sky with such frequency, about one person every three months, that many of Thurston's co-workers kept their office blinds shut. Some colleagues sought counseling to cope with the carnage. I would if I were you too, bitch. Oh my God. But Thurston couldn't stop looking. He felt he had to bear witness to the ongoing tragedy. In 2006, he'd had enough. He organized a group of Fremont residents and other office park tenants to see what could be done. They called themselves Seattle Friends, Fremont Individuals and Employees Nonprofit to Decrease Suicides. And their goal was to achieve what no one else had in seven decades. Seven fucking decades, dude. That's 70 years. That's a long ass fucking time. Jesus Christ. Uh, whew. Thurston soon learned why efforts to erect a suicide barrier had failed in the past. He sent an email to the Washington State Department of Transportation to plead his case. A WS doc official snapped back with a reply that outlined the costs of such a fence in an estimated $8 million, as well as the impossibility of collaboration between Washington State and Seattle. The bridge is state property, but by any decisions regarding it must be approved by the city. The takeaway? Not likely to happen. Thurston was discouraged but undeterred. He and Seattle friends regrouped. They spoke to architects about possible fence designs and made appointments with elected officials WS. Dot couldn't ignore. The bridge, meanwhile, continued to lure people to its edge. Ah, uh, this is a long fucking article, dude. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead to Kaylin Rose Campbell because she's a very interesting person. I care more about her than Ryan Thurston. I care about her story a little bit more. Just saying. Into this postcard rolled Kaylin Rose Campbell. 20. Redheaded. Tall. Runway model thin. She'd been living in western Colorado. It's bald hillsides and parched air, a far cry from lush Emerald City. Before that, Auburn, California, where she had watched her father die slowly, painfully, from hepatitis. Before that, well, stick pin on a map of Europe and you'll likely hit something close to one of her former haunts. See, Kaylin was always on the move. Her mother, Erica Kitzman, lost her in a pine tree when she was three. They were in Rocket Park in Grand Junction, Colorado. The swing sets and monkey bars were shaped like spacecraft. But Kaylin went for the tree. She'd spotted a bird, followed it up limb by limb. By the time Erica noticed, her toddler was looking down from her, 25 feet above. The branches were too slender for the adults to climb after her, and so calmly, they coaxed her down. Her father worked in telecommunications, and the family moved around a lot. But everywhere they went, New York, Nebraska, Kaylin's curiosity and fearlessness was constant. In a field outside Omaha, Erica pointed out a snake in the brush and turned to Kaylin and her brother, William, to explain what it was. But no Kaylin. Erica spun around. Kaylin was holding the snake. She was five. In Guatemala, where Kaylin and William studied Spanish as teens, Kaylin overheard a local mention that he was on his way to butcher a pig. She followed the stranger into the jungle at 4 a.m. Her explanations. She had never butchered a pig before and wanted to see what it was like. Though the family finally put down its roots in California when she was nine, the nomad lifestyle had settled in her bones. After high school, Kaylin split for the Eastern Hemisphere to work for nonprofits that promoted peace and charity in Wales, Germany, France, and Greece. In Seattle, she enrolled in the University of Washington's linguistics department. Made sense. She spoke Spanish and dabbled in Greek, Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Norwegian. And she read Latin, which she taught herself while bedridden with tonsillitis at age nine. What impressed Kaylin's Seattle friends the most, though, was her ear for music. She didn't read notation, but she composed elaborate piano scores. And if she listened to a tune once, she could play it back. When Brett Cheat heard her play on the porch of a Finney Ridge pub late in the summer of 2008, he was smitten. He just performed on stage and was messing around with his guitar on a little Casio keyboard, which Kaylin spontaneously grabbed and began to noodle away on. He accompanied her on his six string. They didn't say a word during the entire jam. She showed up a week later at his workplace, a bar near Lake Union, and finally spoke. Hi, I really enjoyed the show, she said. She wrote down her name in Greek, K, and her phone number. Within days, they'd become inseparable. She moved into his house in Fremont, along with her two cats, and they spent the rest of the summer and fall hiking and road tripping in his red 1990 out through the Cascades. By the winter of 2009, when she wasn't playing music and hanging out with Brett or spending time with her mother who'd recently moved from Colorado to Squim, she was with Amanda Johns, a recent Western Washington University grad from Spokane. They often hit the dance floor at the Nectar in Fremont or the Tractor in Ballard. It was always inevitable that some douchebag was going to come up on us. Amanda recalls, I felt sorry for the guys because she would definitely humble them. She'd keep a smile on her face and she had the sweetest voice to wear if you were 
weren't listening to her words, it would sound like she was singing you a lullaby. Like, kick rocks, dick, and it would sound so sweet. They commiserated over having lost a parent. Amanda lost her mother when she was 10. Kaylin's father, with whom she was very close, died in 2005 when she was 19. I've had a lot of time to deal with it, but Kay, with her father, Amanda explains, she really hung on to it. Over time, Brett learned things Kay hid from most people. She struggled with bulimia and anorexia. She also said that shortly after, she had been married to a person. Her mother, Erica, describes as completely inappropriate. It wasn't a legal union. They didn't have a marriage license, and it only lasted a few months. There was more. Around the time the marriage fizzled, Kay revealed to Brett that she had tried to kill herself by overdosing on her bulimia medication. The ER had to pump her stomach to save her. After her release from the hospital, she dropped out of college and sought counseling for depression. She was making progress, Erica says, until her therapist, this is dramatic as fuck and this sounds like a Hollywood movie, oh my god, terminated treatment because he fell in love with her and pulled her. Bro, that's not okay. As Brett and Kaylin's relationship progressed, he would notice tears in her eyes for no apparent reason. When he asked her about it, she'd often say that she was thinking about her father and how much she missed him. Other times she'd say she felt intense sadness but couldn't or wouldn't pinpoint it. I have to turn the light on. It's just too dark. I can't do it anymore. It's too dark. All right, let's do this thing again, folks. Once again, under the beach, dear friends, and once more, once more. At a bar in Greenwood, men drink alone and drink a lot. They suck down bottle after bottle of Miller High Light and are drunk by three in the afternoon. Their unkempt hair curls out from under sweat-stained baseball caps and they regularly comment on the female bartender's assets loudly and as though they were in a strip club. Fucking gross, boys and girls. This is where Kaylin Campbell worked for most of 2009 and all of 2010. She'd found a job on Craigslist a few months after she and Brett started dating and bartending during the day shifts 11 to five. All these dirty old guys hitting on her, says Brett, just treating her like she was a bar wench. Not being polite, not tipping her, she actually brought home the logbook so that we could read through it for entertainment scary stories. There'd be like Russian guy came in again last night with a knife. Flip another page and there's like a part of a crack pipe taped into the logbook and it says found this piece of a pipe in the bathroom. What the fuck bitch? Amanda and Brett both say that the bar and its clientele made Kay sad. I don't blame you bitch. Damn. I've been there. Ooh. Trigger those memories. Um. Let's go back to this right okay thank you let's not talk about the past of my life georgie's past anyways back to the video amanda and brett both say that the bar and its clientele made Kay sad all those ruined lives they were like an undertow that sucked her down she said she hated it but she didn't look for another job brett was also increasingly alarmed by how much Kay was drinking he would pick her up from work and she'd already be on her way to blackout drunk, which by mid 2010 had become almost a nightly occurrence. Ooh, boy, it's getting real as uh, the situation became impossible to ignore. In October 2010, two years into their relationship, when Kay was drinking with a co worker at the house in Fremont after a shift, around midnight, she offered to drive the co worker home. They hopped into Brett Audi. Kay took the first corner at 30 miles per hour and whacked into the back of a parked Toyota. Sky on. Well, who cares what the fuck kind of car it was you know who cares shit dog i don't know cars for shit which then smacked into a parked chrysler instead of stopping Kay wheeled back around the block and parked across the street from her house jesus the cops responded to a 911 call, showed up within minutes. Kay called one of the cops a dick and told another when she was asked if she wanted to know the results of her breathalyzer test. No, I don't give a shit. She had blown a .265, more than three times the legal driving limit. A month later, Brett says he gave her an ultimatum, stop drinking or move out. Kaylin found an ad on Craigslist seeking a roommate in Queen Anne. Who she and one of her cats, the other stayed with Brett, moved into a two bedroom with a guy from Morocco. Amanda didn't see her for two weeks. Then one night in early December, Kaylin called, I need to come over. Two minutes later, she arrived in a taxi at Amanda's Greenwood apartment. So she comes up to my front porch and she starts bawling. She told Amanda about the DUI and she said she was a bad person and that she hated herself. And one more thing, she said I walked to the bridge the other night. Kaylin said the only reason she didn't jump is because she didn't want to hurt her family. Bridge was in worse 
shape than W.S. Dot had realized. Twenty three steel beams upon which the fence posts were to be fastened were corroded beyond use. Steel supports had to be fabricated and attached to them. Worse, when the original bridge builders poured the concrete pedestrian sidewalk, cement bled to the bridge's underbelly. So as the contractor began removing the bridge's old rivets and vibrations from the rivet buster shook loose the excess concrete. Fearing that cars or pedestrians below might be hit by the fist sized chunks. WS Dot Project Engineer Alita Orshowa, I'm so sorry, ordered construction to stop while crews removed the overflow. That delayed them at least two weeks. Kaylin said, I walked to the bridge the other night. In September, a 23 year old Brenton woman jumped off the bridge to her death. The crew doubled its efforts to install the fence panels, 682 in all, racing to meet the January 1st deadline. And when it became obvious that they wouldn't, they raced to complete the fence before anyone else jumped. With all the setbacks, says Bourgeois, we added 45 days to the project. The lead contractor postponed his honeymoon to speed progress. Wow, that's insane. He was married in November, but he made the decision to wait. By mid-January 2011, the fence was nearly complete, save for a handful of gaps. I think I'm in love. That was Kaylin Campbell, much to the surprise of her friend Amanda. After Kay had scared her with the talk of the bridge, Amanda didn't expect to see a smile on her face. But there it was, just a few weeks later. She had met Brian Wilson, a sustainable business business consultant. She was the happiest I had ever seen her in months. Amanda says she liked her new place and Brian just made her so incredibly happy. The three met at a bar in early January. Brian showed up late and said, I don't want to disturb you ladies. I'm just going to grab a pool table. When he walked off, Kay just had this look in her eye. Like, I don't know, just the cutest little faint smile and just completely dreaming. Amanda says everybody wants someone to look at them that way. As for what happened next, she says, I'll never understand. I never will. For Brian, there were two red flags. The first was when Kaylin mentioned the film, The Bridge, the same documentary about the Golden Gate Bridge that Ryan Thurston had watched to understand the mindset of jumpers. Kaylin told Brian that she was obsessed with it, that she wondered what those people were thinking as they were falling and whether it's the fall that kills them or the impact. That's interesting to think about, you know? What is it that kills them? The fall or the impact? Because I'm pretty sure it's the impact, but I could be wrong. The other, much more alarming revelation came on Wednesday, January 12th, 2011. They were hanging out at her apartment when she told him, a propos of nothing, that she was having a strange day. What do you mean strange? After some prodding, Kay confessed that ever since she was a little girl, she'd had a sadness that she couldn't explain and a drive to hurt herself, that she used to cut herself and burn herself with cigarettes. She admitted that she had begun to cut herself again that week. She had also told him for the first time that she was bulimic. Finally, she said that she couldn't stop thinking about death and dying. I asked her, is this something where you're just fascinated by the idea or is it something bigger? Is it something you're considering yourself personally? Brian says, she basically appeased me somehow and got me to think that she was all right. Now it was Saturday. Three days later, Keelan had spent the previous night at Brian's house and lay awake most of the night with a cough. When she got to work, she was exhausted. Worse, the bar crowd was in rare form. She phoned Brian to vent. Just people being impatient and rude and disrespectful, he recalls. You know, she's got 30 degenerates calling her for her attention and they're just fucking relentless. Hours later she texted I'm off now. Going to have one beer go home and chill out. Brian thought of going to meet her but instead he stuck with his plan for the evening and met up with his old college buddy at a bar in Ballard. Kaylin called around midnight. She said she was at home but that she'd been at Pesos. Mexican Cantina in Queen Anne. She sounded inebriated. I'm sorry that I'm not going to see you tomorrow she said. He reminded her that they had plans to watch the Seahawks game at his dad house and that she was scheduled to work the next day. I said, sweetheart, you're just tired. Just go to bed. Have sweet dreams. Take it easy tonight and I'll see you in the morning. They hung up and he immediately regretted it. This is where I fucked up, Brian recalls. I didn't realize what she was talking about, even though I should have. He called her back. No answer. He kept trying until she finally picked up. I'm coming to your house, he announced. She told him she'd already left the apartment. I love you, she said. I gotta go. It was nice to know you. He drove to her apartment to make sure that she wasn't there. Her roommate wouldn't let him in. Hey bro, the roommate said. It's too late, bro. Brian said. Brian tried explaining the situation, but the roommate was unfazed. After pounding on the door one more time, Brian sat on the sidewalk in front of the building and left a voicemail for Kay. I'm going to call the police. After talking to Officer Alstron, Brian kept searching. He wasn't sure the cops were taking him seriously. SBD units did search the Aurora Bridge up top, down below, for Caitlin. I was fucking maniacal, Brian says. I was running down the deserted street, screaming out her name, hoping that she was just sleeping it off or passed out somewhere 
somewhere, drained, he returned to his car in front of the apartment and dozed for about two hours. Around 6 a.m., as the sun was coming up, he muscled a dumpster over to her second story bedroom window and climbed to go peek inside. He couldn't get a good look, but he heard music. Kay's cat had likely leapt onto her keyboard and played a few notes. Sunday, January 16th. 2011. Kaylin Rose Campbell, 25, jumped off the southeast side of the Aurora Bridge around 5.30 a.m. When he was sleeping. Wow. Fuck. He missed her by 30 minutes. A jogger came across her on a hillside hours later. On the bridge railing above, police discovered a black purse, which included her ID, sitting next to one of the very last gaps in the suicide barrier. Brett Cheek couldn't sleep. He kept hearing things seeing things, shapes in his periphery that disappeared the second he tried to bring them into focus. Aylin, his ex-girlfriend, his best friend, had died two or three days earlier. He'd lost track. A buddy had called him that Sunday afternoon to tell him the news, and he lost it. Just collapsed on the floor and sobbed. He wasn't any better now. They're in the house they'd shared for two years. He called a friend. I've never been so scared in my life. Brett says, I'm shaking, and I didn't want to get off the phone with her. She's like, just stay on the phone with me. Put on your shoes. Put on your jacket. It, get outside or get out of the place and call a cab. The taxi arrived around 4 a.m. Brett opened the car door. I see Kay in the back seat of her car. Her body in the back seat. Her eyes are open. She's staring at me. I shake my head. Of course, I know that I'm hallucinating. It got worse. He gave the driver his friend's address in Ballard. But the driver, inexplicably, went in the opposite direction. Towards the Aurora Bridge. The last place he wanted to go. I start yelling. You're going the wrong way. You're going the wrong way. They drove within in two blocks of the bridge before the driver finally changed course. A couple days later, he floated an idea past Brian Wilson, Kay's last boyfriend, who he'd met briefly at a survivor a suicide counseling session earlier in the week. What if we put on a benefit concert in Kay's honor? Both men were intimately tied to the Fremont music scene. Brett as a performer, Brian as a fan. On April 6th, three months later, a crowd descended on Nectar, one of Kay's favorite places to dance, for the Kaylin Rose Campbell Benefit for Life concert. Brett, Brian, and Amanda had discussed where the proceeds should go. Erica, Kaylin's mother, sold them on the Seattle chapter of the National Alliance on Mental Illness to help prevent tragedies like Kay's in the future. On stage, Joseph Brett Cheat and the Clean Slate Marmalade, a band that had played on the nights that Kaylin first spoke to both Brett and Brian, and Michael Shreve, a friend of Kay who had happened to be Santana's former drummer and the youngest person on stage at Woodstock. That's so cool, dude. KRC4L raised 2007 hundred dollars for NAMI. Brett and Brian plan to hold more benefit concerts and expand KRC4L into a non-profit foundation centered on suicide and mental health issues. Erica Kitzman couldn't attend. She was in the midst of moving back to Colorado. After Kay died, she couldn't bear to be in region anymore. I told family that I moved to Squim for the weather. She recently confessed that it would be better for my health, but the truth is I was terrified about Kaylin. I wanted to be near her because I knew she was sick and getting worse. Who knows? Maybe me being her kept her alive for a few more months. One more key person was not at the benefit concert. A few weeks after Kay's death, as her friends and family were reeling from the loss, an article in the Seattle Times made an oblique, inaccurate, and insensitive reference. The last panel of the fence had been set in place on February 15th, exactly one month after Kaylin's death. Today is February 15th, by the way. That's weird. The newspaper, which had covered Aurora Bridge suicide since the very first leap in 1932, identified the last victim, K, as a teenager. And the WS Dot spokesperson it quoted said the death on the popular suicide bridge wasn't a surprise. Erica phoned the Times, rebuked the reporter, until the reporter cried and got a correction printed. Thank you, Erica. Fuck. Yes, Queen. Work. Brett called the WS Dot spokesperson who apologized. But Brett persisted, demanding to know why the barrier wasn't put up in time to stop Kaylin. He was passed on to Alita Bourgeois, the project engineer. She explained the history, the engineering setbacks, the contractor who sacrificed his honeymoon to finish the barrier. By the time the phone call ended, Brett had calmed down. He was even satisfied with the answers, but he wasn't prepared for what came next. No one was. A donation check arrived for the Kaylin Rose Campbell for Life Benefit. It was signed by Alito. That was a powerful fucking article, dude. That was powerful. I don't usually cry on camera, man. And people know this about me because I don't really like crying on camera. But like when articles like this, you know, are presented and I find them, you know, just out of random happenstance because I'm fascinated by something 
and they touch me in a way that's just like, it's so impactful. Like this article, this article, wow, wow. And I want, I want, I want everyone to know who Kaylin Rose Campbell is. And I want all of you guys to donate to her cause if you can. Doesn't matter if you can or cannot. But I hope this story impacted you as deeply and greatly as it did to me. Because this entire just whole scenario it snowballed for me being fascinated by a play. By, you know, a 20 minute play that I saw last week, you know, which caused me to start researching. And I came across this beautiful fucking article heartbreaking but so amazing about what has been done to help prevent this from happening again and if you didn't catch what I said at the end of that because I was crying it said but he wasn't prepared for what came next no one was a donation check arrived for the Kaylin Rose Campbell for Life benefit it was signed by Alita Bourgeois how cool is that I hope this story impacted you because it was really powerful to me. And I felt the need to talk about this because once again, this is in my own city. This had been happening in, you know, and there's the history there. My family has lived in Washington, like in Seattle for over four generations. That's a long time to be in that city for. That's four generations of my family crossing that bridge. That's crazy. So of course this suicide story overall, because this story was what it was, is why it resonated so deeply within me and why I'm gonna link this article in the description box below and I'll also try and find her donation page and link that down below as well and I will link the suicide hotline number as well and resources in which you can access if you are struggling I know this video is super long but it definitely definitely needed this like this was cathartic for me in a way. Thanks for coming along on this journey with me. And if you liked this video and you wanna see more videos kinda of like this, please feel free to leave your comments and suggestions down below in the description box, in the comment section down below. Not the description box, that's not the right one. That was a lot, that was a lot. Took a lot out, but like honestly, so good. What a good story. Once again, I hope this story resonated with you. And if you liked this video, please like and subscribe. I make new videos every Wednesday and I'll catch you guys next week. Kate, thanks, bye. Bye.